Welcome everybody, thank you so much for coming. This is our parent support group um, themed on talking all things transitions. Um, I'm Ellen, um, I'm the events coordinator at Look. I'm actually not now, I just realised I've given my old job title. <laughs> my role has changed a couple of months ago and I need to get out of the habit of saying that, but I think you all know me. Um, if you haven't been to one of our parent support groups before, um, we are doing things a little bit differently tonight because we are having a themed session. So we have um, presentations from Vicky and Jane and two of our uh, fantastic look mentors, Liam and Bryony to start with. Um, so they'll be kind of giving a bit of a presentation um, and talking to you a bit about their experiences for the first half. Um, so after that point, we will then have time for questions. Um, so just hold on to your questions until um, we finish the presentations and then we'll have a lot of time to chat afterwards. Um, just to let you know, I'll just go through a couple of housekeeping things. So we are recording the session to comply with our safeguarding policy um, and we may edit uh, parts of that recording to make into a resource afterwards. So what we think we're gonna do is um, edit the, the, the presentations from the speakers um, to make available for people to listen back, back to afterwards. So it will just be those um, sections and not the Q&A section. Um, you will have signed up, uh, read our code of conduct um, when you were signing up those sessions. So please be mind of, mindful of that and just to use respectful language. Um, and just to make sure that everyone can hear each other um, as best as possible, please stay muted if you're not speaking. You should be able to unmute yourself, um, but just if you've got a lot of background noise. Um, then please stay muted if you can. When you do want to um, add something to the conversation or ask a question, you can raise your hand. Um, so that's under reactions, um, or if you're using keyboard shortcuts, that's Alt Y or Option Y. Um, or you can also use the chat. Um, so the chat feature on Zoom, you can. there's a text box to type in there. I'll be keeping an eye on the chat and passing any questions on to Jane. Um, so feel free to use that as well. Um, <clears throat> during the session and we will be keeping an eye on things there. I think that's all we have in terms of housekeeping. So I'm going to hand you over now to Jane um, to start with our discussion. Thank you for coming and hopefully this will be useful. Um, I know that I could have done with this session when my daughter was actually from when she was about year four because I was quite scared of the next stage already so um, yeah this is why I put this together but also I think Vicky's got similar experiences both of our children have transferred to secondary quite recently but we've also got Lyran and Bryony and um, they've kind of come out the whole education system so they've got experiences all the way through so it's really good that they're here to um, talk to us later. So I have got something to share with you. This is Transition, a survival guide for parent carers of visually impaired young people. So you can see on the slide my beautiful daughter at three years old and I'm holding on quite tightly and she's about to take her go to her first day at nursery school um, and then the other picture is her on her first day at secondary school just so different and as you can see I'm no longer holding her because it was such a big step um, I was in the background but it's very different <laughs> and I think that's the thing I think change is really really hard for our children, but really hard for us as well, kind of trusting other people, trusting the people that are gonna be with them and trusting that um, they will be safe. And um, what I really know is that the preparation um, to the different stages is as important to us as parents as it is to our young people. Um, when Chloe was going to do her sessions so she had transition days and she had orientation and mobility sessions and I think her orientation mobility officer picked up that I was a bit anxious and invited me to um, visit the secondary school with Chloe when she was having a session with her and she got a timetable, her braille timetable and she said to Chloe okay you've got um, science next show us where you're going to go and 
Chloe with her amazing mapping skills and the session she'd had previously just just went from class to class and it was the most reassuring thing and it showed me that she was ready and it, it did make a huge difference to me as well. So that was the first thing that I wanted to share with you, but also the understanding the expectations of the school. For anybody whose child is about to go to secondary, the relationship you have as a parent is so different at secondary school. And it doesn't mean that you can't communicate with them, but it that the bigger schools there, they got so many people involved and it's really important to know beforehand what, how they expect you to communicate with them um, because it's very different. So I had to use every ounce of, ounce of patience, calm, and all my communication skills and change them a bit actually um, for secondary, but um, she's in year eight and it is getting better. And I think I had to lower my expectations in a way. I, I realized it couldn't be the same relationship as it was before. And remember to breathe because we're as anxious probably as the young people that are going up and actually they're everything, they pick it up. So. I know that um, I, I would drop her off and then I'd go for a long walk afterwards if I wasn't working because I just needed to kind of just stay calm and, and they do get through it. So these are my top tips. So to plan and practice routes and routines for your young people. So Chloe had a really good active orientation mobility officer who um, actually in the summer term picked Chloe up every couple of weeks, took her on the bus, practiced the bus route with her, practiced crossing the road safely, um, and then did the routes around school, as I said. And it, it meant that she knew, like I've said, where she was going by the time she got there. And she, one of the best, and the when I realized it was a success was when she showed other year sevens where they needed to go. I was like, that's how it should be. Um, so yeah, the support from VI professionals is so key. So our qualified teacher with a visually impaired, obviously yays lots about equipment and making sure that everything was in place for Chloe at the school. And the orientation mobility officer was really, really hands-on too. Um, and actually they turned up in the inset days before Chloe started. Chloe came to the school just to have one last look round and check that she was comfortable before school started the next day. But they turned up and it was brilliant because they troubled they they did lots of troubleshooting which we hadn't expected um, so that their, their involvement is key and the training for staff and students is absolutely essential as well because there's suddenly so many more staff involved with your children so for them to understand their needs their access needs how they work is so key and also students understanding um, yeah it, it makes all the difference one of our mentors said that um, it's, the transition days is it's not just the normal ones, go as much as you can, which I would absolutely agree with. And Chloe School did a summer school, which we were away for, but I know that would have helped as well, just as many times as they can go to the new place to make, to make it familiar. Have as many meetings with the school as is necessary without putting them off you, because they're used to, that young people being much more independent it is a big balance but having said that Chloe went on a residential very soon after she started secondary and we had three or four meetings about that because it was such a key thing to get right and it was a success and I was really grateful that the school and the person organizing it said yep yeah, we know this is important so they met me which was great and her team all of her team Keep lines of communication open with your child as much as possible, because I think that's the thing, isn't it? There, our children cope with a lot of things, but don't. It's very hard when things maybe are a bit tricky. So even if they're not able to talk about it, kind of just be there, and and you'll know if things aren't quite right as well. So you know, trust your parenting. 
a range team around the child or family meetings. They're called different things at different local authorities to iron out any teething problems. And we had three in the first year, kind of, and then I know COVID struck, but it is really key because then you can meet with the team, you can check that the Senko is doing what they need to do, that everything's right, and if people are not missing things. So that's really key. And trust that the school want to make it work. It, often, um, it depends what setting they're going to, but often they might be the first um, child in the school or probably the first one with the different things that they're presenting. So, so they might make it, it might not always look exactly right, but they do want to make it work. And that's what I realized. So this is Vicky's slide. So Vicky, do you want to talk through this bit for me? Yeah, not a problem. So making sure all equipment is in suit and working enables for smooth start. So everything from primary school, your embossers, your Zarkin machines, whatever equipment that you use, make sure that it's all signed off from counter to be moved to the high school with enough time for everything to be ready. <laughs> um, a designated support room for equipment preparation and downtime. We've noticed that we needed quite a lot of room because there's quite a lot of equipment because Emily's a braillist, so we needed embossers, laptops, computers. We've got it all basically. Um, so they needed somewhere to work from as well. But we've also noticed that downtime's quite a big thing in high school. You don't realise how tired they get. So having a room to go to just to have five minutes quiet or go to the room to do a lesson was what we needed. Um, all teachers trained and have the timetable ready before start of the school year, awareness for the whole school. Like Jane said, teacher training is a must to this day. Um, we're coming to the end of year seven now and we're still having problems with teachers not following the structure that we put in place, even after training. And then you've got a continuation of teachers leaving, new teachers coming in. They, they need to be on top of teacher training. It's a must for, <coughs> for, for everybody. Um, we, so the whole school, Emily very bravely did a video of herself using a bit of a braille equipment and telling people who she is and what she is. And if they see her in the corridor to say hello and say, oh, it's so-and-so speaking to you. Hello, Emily, it's Miss whoever. Just so that, and that was shown to the whole of the year seven group. So they was all made aware and now it's eventually been shown to the whole school. So people are more aware of her walking around the corridors when she's off doing a job or she's off walking around going to dinner. QTVRs and habilitation timetable of support to be in place. It's another essential. They need to know where they're going. They need to know what days they're coming in, what they're going to work on. Um, environmental audit is normally done by counter. That is a must, again, to make sure that there's no obstacles in, in the way or if anything needs changing. Bits of ripped up carpet that might need tacking down. That all needs to be done in the environment audit. We had trouble with ours because our transition come in COVID. So a lot of our planning didn't go to plan. So it ended up that our habilitation officer did the environmental audit. And we're still waiting for things to be done. Mm. Um, get to know new theaters. Another thing, sometimes you might have one to year, sometimes you might have two, but get to know them and get let your child get to know them. Have as many meetings as you think you need. Um, ordering of resources. Obviously, we've talked about this in other group, in, in our group in the past. There is places where you can order resources from, textbooks and stuff that can be pre-ordered to make sure that they're ready and in school and just having lots of meetings to work out anything that needs working out between new tiers, old tiers, a lot of liaising with primary staff to make sure that everything's ready and they understand 
the child's needs. And I think, and the, the other thing that we did was we made a transition requirement form so that can be shared and updated as things go on. So everything that we planned, we'd make a list on who was to do it and when it was to be done by. So then when things got done, you could take it off and move on or you could share it and say, this hasn't been done yet, where we're we going with it. So that's my top tips for transition. Thank you, Vicky. Um, I realise I didn't, for those who don't know us, so Chloe's now 13 and gone, is in year eight, but it's been a very up and down time anyway, because she'd started um, in year seven and then kind of had a term. Um, it went, and the first term, everyone was very nice and she was quite confident, but I think was struggling, but couldn't quite articulate it. And then the second term was much trickier. And then we went into lockdown. So it was it that, you know, that's not ideal, um, but she has survived and she's still going in and she's amazing, resilient. And, I, and I've learned a lot um, through the whole process. Um, but what I wish I'd known are things like how different my relationship would be with the school. I mean, with the primary school, it was really open. Obviously it was one teacher and sometimes I had teachers that didn't get Chloe as much, but the Senko would always try and intervene. And the school worked so hard to include her and to um, make sure she had a really positive experience all the time, but it was a much smaller school and they, they, um, their ethos was kind of inclusion. So things like sports day were kind of accessible for Chloe, which made everything else for the other children accessible, if that makes sense. So, but it, it's not like that at secondary. And I think I, it took me a long time to understand that. And I wish I'd be more prepared because I'm just so open and I just thought I'd be able to have meetings all the time. And initially they were very patient. And then it was obvious that they just needed to, they wanted to get on with Chloe being their student. Um, and it was really interesting assumptions would be made. I was told that, you know, she's like any other 11 year old, she's going to struggle with, with socializing. And it took a while with between me and um, her, the support staff to say no but Chloe's visually impaired she's also hearing impaired the social side needs a lot more work and support and um, you know I think I'm getting there but she's now in year eight so it's taken a while for that education to filter and to be understood but it is happening so which gives you hope um, the tiredness I had no idea about. Um, Jack who has written in some of them one of the mentors said that at primary school he'd get home and do his homework straight away but he needed time at secondary afterwards before he got on with it and I just think there's so much noise or the navigating of corridors there's there's things that you can't imagine and they they do cope but they do they are incredibly tired and Chloe needs a quiet space at school now as well as Vicky mentioned but the exciting things as well is that Chloe's imagination her interest in learning has been completely sparked by all these other subjects and that's that's really exciting and it's often the different teachers she loves history she loves English and that's because the teachers the the depth of knowledge they have and um, that they're bringing the subjects um, to light for her. So that's really good. The second term is where there might be wobbles. I think it's just because the social side of things changes in the second term. And I don't really quite understand it because I'm not 11 year old child anymore, but I know that I really, really needed to catch her in that term. So it's just it's just good to be aware and maybe make sure you have those meetings in the first second and third term at least um, when they've transitioned and the key staff are absolutely incredible um, I yeah I, I have Chloe has found people that champion her and say no I want to teach Chloe next year because I don't want her to have to start again and you know they make relationships with her and then they want to keep her on um, teaching her and that that's brilliant it's so rewarding 
that whatever goes wrong can usually be fixed. I think it feels so hard, doesn't it? That whole look at my little girl going off to nursery and then the secondary and it feels much more like a lion's den but actually people do want to make it work and um, you might have to do that calm and patience and be understanding to a certain point before you actually go no it's not okay but things usually can be fixed and <laughs> the one thing I wish I'd known is that that my child would survive that as as scary and as hard it is for us they are actually tough beings and they will survive so yes so we're going to go on to the mentors now so I'm going to stop sharing because actually we want to hear from Liam and Bryony about their experiences so thank you for listening for this bit um, and I think Liam is going to talk about his experience um, first hi Liam Sure. Hello. Um, Tell us so all I, about you. <laughs> sure, I will do. I will do. Um, okay, so my name's Liam. Um, so I have got nystagmus. So I've got some useful vision. Um, not a great amount of vision, but I'm also not. I'm registered partially sighted. So um, that's me. Um, I'm 26. So I finished school about eight years ago because I went to. Um, the same school for seven years so I did um, the first five years and I did two years at sixth form um, so I'm just going to talk about a little bit about my transition from primary school to secondary school um, the sort of transitions that happened during secondary school and also a little bit about going into sixth form and then um, I'll briefly touch on what I do what, what I'm doing now um, so what I would say really it's my experience from primary school to secondary school was relatively smooth um, it had some challenges. So um, I know we had a couple of meetings with the school um, whilst I was still in primary school. So um, I was taking on trips up there sort of during my last summer term in year six. Um, so I sort of got to know the, T the TAs, like the support, um, the sort of disability support network. Um, so they had sort of a specialist unit um probably about 15 20 staff members um, most of them ta so i got to meet them got to sort of build a relationship with them before i went to secondary school um so i sort of got to also know the main area where the support block was so i knew where to go if i had trouble throughout the school day um so they were really good in that sense um so obviously the summer holiday came and went um which was quite nerve-wracking for um me really um I wasn't so nervous about making friends or um the lessons themselves the, my biggest worry was learning the, the roots um to be honest with you but because obviously it's primary school you you're always in one one class from 90 percent of the time um whereas when I moved to secondary school um my school is quite big so it's 1800 students um and it wasn't just one building it was it was in the town centre and there was one building and then there was another building um, sort of completely separate. So you had to walk across the town centre to get to it. Now I know my mum was quite um, anxious about that. Um, so, which obviously made me anxious as well. Um, so one thing I would say um, about that is obviously it'll be a nerve wracking time for yourselves and for your children. Um, but try and stay positive because if you're anxious, your, your children will pick up on that. Um, so accept there's going to be challenges and obviously there will be tough times, but definitely try and stay positive for your child because if, if you sort of give the impression that maybe you're, you're not sure if your child can survive at secondary school, then they're going to pick up on that and they're going to doubt themselves as well. So stay positive except there's going to be challenges be realistic there's always going to be challenges um especially for visually impaired people um but try and stay positive and accept things and accept things might go wrong and it's not the end of the world so for example when i did start um like i said moving around finding classrooms was difficult to begin with and to be honest with you it took me some time so i left um lessons a couple of minutes early just to avoid the rushes so i could get my other lessons safely um which was really really helpful for me so i wasn't too worried about 
the bigger children at the time because obviously you're tiny when you're 11 compared to a 16 year old who shut up um and that really helped but also I lost um a few a few pens and pencils and stationery and I left my blazer in a couple of classrooms and that and people lose things just making sure you've got backup backups for equipment I think is is crucial really um and if and if your child does lose something um you know don't be too hard on them just say yeah it's gone wrong but you know learn from it what can you do differently that sort of thing um I think that's really helpful one thing I did to make sure I didn't lose any books which I think is the one thing you really want to make sure you don't lose is I carried around a folder with me um or a if obviously you've got a laptop, you've got a case with you as well. So just keep everything in one place. So you know, you have to look after this. Um, and yeah, I agree um, with what was said earlier. Basically, the first term is great because everyone's really nice. Um, and people, and it's not so much about the learning in the first term. It's about the integration into secondary school. And it's quite a... Um, quite a pleasant environment because everyone's really friendly the f friendship groups haven't really formed yet so everyone speaks to everyone and then I think when you get into the second term I think sometimes you, you might be part of one friendship group but not part of another so sometimes I think integrating and speaking to a wider group of people does become more difficult in maybe the second term in your first year and going into the third term as well and beyond um, so I I do agree actually that maybe the second term can be a bit more difficult but it's not but again it's a challenge but it's a challenge that can be overcome um also as you go through the years I think the next big transition is obviously you grow up and that has its challenges um but also when you learn your subjects and you have the support for those subjects and you have your teachers you then pick your options um for your GCSEs which can be another thing to um sort of you were going to go consider to so when you're picking your options you want to make sure that your child can do the subject so for example you want a visually impaired person to do any subject but also you have to be practical so i was off so i sort of picked geography um history and business studies um so business studies and history was great but Geography was quite difficult with the um, pictures. So I got enlarged pictures for that. And so I could view pictures and view diagrams. So that was great. And, um, but again, it's a transition, but it's also a transition um, that I think is something that any visually impaired person given the right support um, can deal with. Um, going into sixth form as well it was another transition that they had to that I had to deal with um, and, I, and I seemed to feel like I got more confident throughout the years so I start to need less and less support um, because you know that you know the you know the school by then you get bigger you're suddenly the biggest child in the school um, compared to being the smallest um, so yeah I, I honestly just think it's a case of be positive sort of show show your child that you can sort of believe that they can deal with secondary school life um and yeah so there will be challenges but it can work um if i'm being completely honest and the last thing i will say is after school um i got decent a levels and decent gcse's and now now i'm working for the council um sort of in compliance and safeguarding so it does it does work out in the end there are challenges but um, visually impaired people with the right support, they can go into a wide range of roles and they can lead very successful, um, sort of have a very successful education and very successful career. So positivity, there will be challenges, but it can be something that your child will get through. Okay. Thank you. I think Liam. that's pretty much it. Yeah, that's brilliant. Um, there will be time for questioning because I'm sure you have got lots of questions. But um, now I'd just like to hear from Bryony. You've been very patient, Bryony. Thank you. I, I've enjoyed listening. I'm too nervous. <laughs> it's finally I'm going first. Um, so I'm registered blind. I have no useful vision at all, but I did have at school. 
Um, I had a condition called juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, which can cause uveitis and glaucoma in children, or it can go into your organs. So mine went, mine went into my eyes. So although I was visually impaired, I still had quite a lot of vision, just struggled in the dark. Um, quite a lot of hospital appointments in primary school. So quite a lot of the first, like up to year four was quite missed. Um, quite a lot of hospital stays for six weeks onwards. And I did mainstream up until year four. And then my mum decided that I needed a bit of time because my, my reading was rubbish and I was just struggling. So I went to um, a special needs school in Manchester and I, I was taught everything, like my confidence was amazing. I did that from year four and five and then she wanted, my mum wanted me to go back into mainstream because I was going to a mainstream secondary school. So I did year six in primary school in mainstream, which probably was the best one because I then went on to secondary school with my bunch of friends that I'd made in primary school. Um, we looked at other um, possibilities, maybe um, St Vincent's is a special needs school, but my mum didn't kind of want me to go through that and I didn't feel comfortable. I wanted to be like back then like a, a normal school and I wanted to be like my friends. So leaving primary school, I remember we had quite a few orientation visits but we only ever did them when nobody was there and I think it would have been better to have them when people were there as well because it's very different navigating through a building when there's nobody there to when there's hundreds of bigger people there um then I, quite, I had quite a good secondary school experience um I enjoyed it I picked subjects that were quite challenging um technology was very different when I went to school so everything was still kind of written down on blackboards and um, I used to have to photocopy my own stuff I think things have very much changed and I think it's a better time to go to school if you're visually impaired now um but I'm uh, what else was I going to say <laughs> I remember my mum was more worried than I was about going to school because I had my best friend and I knew my best friend was coming but then when we got to school we were in different forms so then that was obviously cause a lot of anxiety because I wasn't with the people that I knew anymore but just have faith in your children and know that they will make friends they'll be different friends and then they went to school with but that's all part of it and then yeah like Liam said don't don't try and rub your anxiety off on your children because they will feel it and I remember finding out years later that my mum followed me in the car all the way to school for the first week and I didn't know about it so if you're going to do it, you're going to be anxious and just be a bit sneaky about it. And don't let them know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I then went on to um, mainstream. I did quite well in my GCSEs. I think I would have done better. I passed them all, but I think I would have done better in them, like a special needs school because I think things would have been a lot easier. But I don't think I'd have been the person I am if I hadn't at least tried mainstream. Um, then I went on to mainstream college, found that really too hard. And that's when I discovered RNC, went there and did my A-levels and then went on to uni. Um, I'm a qualified counsellor, but now I'm on the <laughs> another pathway because I'm a mum and my baby's just like progressed from reception to year one. So I've got all the parent anxieties of the same with, but he's fully sighted. So I'm coming in as a blind mum, like trying to get the same kind of st stuff like for him, but I need accessibility stuff with him and school are not kind of understanding that. And through lockdown, it was very difficult. People, they were sending stuff like on Teams and I couldn't access it. And But primary school is a bit more helpful. So, but yeah, um, so I have the same anxieties now as a mum, even though it's the other way around so that's oh, my story brilliant Bryony thank you and and actually some really good points um so I am just going to share again because um 
Jack, who is, I think he, I think this is right, Ellen, he's um, totally blind. He's a primary school teacher and um, he, he couldn't come tonight, but he wanted to share some of his thoughts as well. So, uh, there you go. So I'm just talking to myself. Um, so, so I asked him these questions. Um, so hopefully you'll find them useful. What helped you make change bef between educational settings? The days, and I think we've all said that as well, that, um, that it's just so important, but also really importantly, as Bryony said, have make sure that there are people there when you're doing the orientation and logistics because it's so different um, and knowing routines actually I know that Chloe and I practiced what she was going to do um, we didn't get very far on the buses because then Covid struck but we were taking her on the bus and um, going with her hopefully then eventually she was going to go on her own but that hasn't happened um, but it, it, it was really helpful on the lead up because we practiced loads. I practiced how I was going to take her and pick her up. And the getting stuck in is really key as well. I know Chloe's a lot more settled this term and she's this year and she's joined the drama club. So it's a really good hint. Um, so what can parents do to support their children? Just being there when you need them without being too anxious so that's I'm sure we can all do that and <laughs> I love this point letting you off for things like getting your kit bag for the first term or two and I think that's so key you, you kind of want your child to be independent you know that they should be doing these things on their own now but actually they have got so much to remember so being that nice mum and dashing into school with cake ingredients is something that we can all remember to do and um, the good communication links to the school. Sometimes the Senko is really busy, so there might be the one of the TAs who's really active or, you know, but just knowing that communication open. But I love Jack's point about giving the child time to work things out, because actually we need our children to be problem solvers and, um, you know, kind of also let us know when things aren't happening. So, um, so this is the advice from the experts, as in the mentors. Um, get familiar with the school setting before the term starts. So yeah, it, it, is, it makes all the difference. Um, again, he said about the additional interests. Um, don't be afraid to hold teachers accountable. And I think that is really key. It's so hard. We're trying to build a relationship with a new place. But actually, it is all right to say um, just like Bryony had with her child not being able to access things. Um, it's OK to say because that's our job still, um, as well as the qualified teacher for the visually impaired and the other teams. We are we can say when it's they can't access the work. Um, yes. Yeah, so to give your child space, but know when to intervene. I know that for Chloe, I set up, I don't know if anyone's been to any of the other things we've done, but when I could see she was struggling, I set up a system where she still loves squishies and she, wouldn't, she couldn't talk about things, but I just put a pot on the table. And if she had a bad day, she put a lemon squishy in the pot, just to say, so her dad and I knew she'd had a bad day. And then if it was a good day, she had a cake. And it was just nice to know. It was hard for her to talk about, but it was nice to know. So, okay, well, thank you very much for listening.